Welcome everyone to another edition of Conversations That Matter, which is brought to you by Holland and Knight's Consumer Protection, Defense and Compliance Team, as well as especially today with the MBA Commercial Law Section. And I want to give a special thanks to the Chair of the MBA Law Section, Andrew Nunez, for helping to uh, bring this program to, to us today. I am, as Audra said, Quamina thomas Williford. I'm a partner in Holland and Knight's DC office and co-chair of Holland Knight's Consumer Protection, Defense, and Compliance team. And with me today is my colleague, Bill Farley, who is a litigation partner out of our Chicago office who litigates data privacy matters and does a lot with the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, also known as BIPA. Uh, he and I today have the extreme pleasure of moderating um, uh, are having a discussion to so we'll moderate and, and ask questions of Manisha Mathal. She is the Associate Director of the Federal Trade Commission's Division of Identity, of Privacy and Identity Protection. She's been with the FTC for 22 years, which is absolutely great. And she focuses currently on consumer protection, our consumer privacy, data security, and credit reporting issues, which we'll talk about a little bit today. She also manages significant initiatives, including reports on big data, the data broker industry, the Internet of Things, and mobile privacy disclosures. In addition to that, she's also testified before Congress on connected cars, facial recognition, and identity theft. Again, some great topics we're going to get into today. And if that isn't enough on top of all of that, uh, Manisha also supervises dozens of consumer enforcement act of Commission enforcement actions. So she brings that perspective to bear as well and just makes um, for a very, lay the foundation for a very robust discussion for the next hour. So we are so grateful that you all are here with us today. And I want to welcome Manisha. Manisha, welcome so much. We're happy to have you this, this afternoon for this hour. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Wonderful. And um, we're just going to jump right into it because we, we have a couple of kind of prepared questions for you. Um, and we also want to encourage those who are in the audience, if you have questions, um, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll try to make sure that we, um, we raise them with the, uh, Manisha within the hour. Um, but Manisha, we wanted to start off with kind of a high level um, piece in terms of really understanding what the FTC's priorities are, particularly in the privacy space. We know that back in uh, February, um, Acting Chairwoman uh, Slaughter forecasted through the privacy agenda um, and emphasized a few, a few things. If you can just um, talk a little bit about the FTC's priorities in the privacy arena um, and, and what's being done currently. Great. Thank you so much, Kumina, and thank you for the generous introduction. Um, so in terms of FTC priorities, um, maybe I, I'll just start by mentioning three and we can drill down and um, go however we want. So, um, so I think the first is privacy issues related to the pandemic. Uh, now, the FTC does a lot of work on COVID-related scams, but there have been a lot of privacy issues that have come to the forefront during the pandemic. So, for example, um, the ed tech, the explosion of ed tech. Um, and online programs and apps directed to kids that schools use to teach their to teach kids as they are home during the pandemic. Um, we put out business guidance for um, for ed tech providers. We put out guidance to schools. We put out guidance to parents. Um, so this is an area that you know we had always been interested in. But it's really come to the forefront as a result of COVID. Um, another kind of COVID-related priority is health, of course. Um, so we, um, we see a lot of consumers who may be afraid to go to doctor's offices because of the pandemic. And so we've seen an explosion in the youth, use of health apps that are not necessarily covered by HIPAA, uh, but they are covered by the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair deceptive practices. So for example, earlier this year, we brought a case against a fertility app um, that said that they would not share consumers information with third parties, um, but they in fact did share um, patient information with companies like Facebook and Google. Uh, and we alleged that was a deceptive practice under the FTC Act and we entered into a settlement with the company. So, so COVID related privacy issues would be the first category of priorities. Um, second is uh, racial justice issues. Um, and um, I think two, two, two kind of pieces come to mind on that. The first is algorithmic discrimination. Um, we enforce a law called the Fair Credit Reporting Act that would apply when companies use algorithms um, to discriminate 
or to deny people benefits unduly. So a couple of years ago, we brought a case against a company called RealPage, which was a tenant screening company that used an algorithm to determine whether the applicant um, had a criminal record. Um, but the algorithm really just mismatched names. So like a Marvin uh, Garcia would be confused with a Martha Garcia. So, um, so, so th those are the kinds of issues where algorithms are used to deny particular classes of people certain benefits. I think on, on algorithms, we also see um, a problem in advertising where algorithms may determine who to send ads to. And as a result, certain minority populations might get ads for more predatory lending products, for example, or subprime products, while other populations might get uh, you know, high-end financing ads. Um, and so we, we think that th there's a real problem there. It's almost a form of digital redlining. And so that's an area of huge priority. And then the last area I'd mention as a priority is, um, is just tech generally. A um, lot of, um, you know, whether it's uh, big data or I, uh, Internet of Things products or facial recognition. And, and let me just give you a facial recognition example. Um, earlier this year, we announced a case against EverAlbum that basically said, this was a photo sharing and storage app. And they said, we will not use your photos for facial recognition unless you opt in. Um, but they in fact did use people's photos uh, and, and used a facial recognition algorithm um, and, um, and sold that algorithm to other companies and made money from that. So, um, so facial recognition is, is an example of a technology that we're very interested. So I've thrown a lot at you, happy to drill down into any of those uh, pieces um, or move on to a different topic. So first of all, thank you. And I think all of those pieces we want to drill down on a little bit today because they're, they're such hot topics right now for many, uh, definitely for a lot of our clients that we interact with, but I'm sure a lot of those on the phone call as well. And, and I want to hit on one piece um, first. When you mentioned kind of the, the algorithms and the digital redlining, that, that's very, very important. And, and quite frankly now, when many companies are utilizing and relying on AI more and more in order to build in efficiencies, um, you know, being aware of the impact that the algorithm can have is very important. Are there certain um, considerations that, that, that you or the FTC have, have thought about that for companies as they're thinking or building these algorithms, you know, regarding how to do it the right way in terms of controlling for potentially these impacts? You know, is there recommendations for doing more monitoring? Is there recommendations for troubleshooting on the front end? Like how can um, people be responsible actors yeah. when it comes to AI and, and, and knowing that there's a consideration on the back end with the impact that it's having that you mentioned? Yeah, so, so we did a, um, I think you mentioned this in the intro, we did a report on these big data practices a couple of years ago and I think the advice in that report still stands. So I think there's two pieces. The first is make sure you understand what laws apply. So I talked about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. If you're using an algorithm um, to deny people housing, employment, insurance, um, credit. Um, you could be covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which requires certain adverse action notices to consumers, certain you know, accuracy requirements, et cetera. Um, second is um, Section 5 of the FTC Act, um, which um, basically prohibits deceptive or unfair practices. So if you advertise an algorithm and say, you know, this is, you know, this is going to get to non-discriminatory results, um, but you haven't done any substantiation for that or any testing for that, that could be a deceptive practice. Um, if you use the algorithm in a way, in a way that causes discrimination, um, that could be an unfair practice. Um, and that brings me to the third law, which is, now there's a lot of fair um, housing and employment and anti-discrimination laws, a lot of civil rights laws that we don't enforce. The one civil rights law that we do enforce is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, um, where um, if you discriminate um, based on protected class in, in terms of your provision of um, uh, you know, credit or uh, th that that could be a violation of the uh, ECOA. And we brought a case against a company called Bro Bronx Honda last year alleging a violation of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. So that's kind of the legal piece. And then I think there's kind of a best practices piece. Um, and um, I, I think there's a couple of things that we want companies to watch out for. One is the kind of garbage in, garbage out problem, because the algorithm is only as good as the data that's used to power the algorithm. So for example, um, if you're using a data set that only covers populations that have, um, you know, broadband internet access, 
maybe you're excluding certain populations that don't have broadband internet access. And if you're using that data to make judgments and, and you know, make outcomes about people, you could have these areas where you're not considering the impact on people that don't have broadband access. Um, another example is we know that several companies um, uh, were using algorithms based on kind of, okay, here are good employees and let's develop an algorithm to replicate the good employees and, um, and then um, and figure out what we should be looking for. Well, of course, that's gonna replicate existing biases. And so those are the types of things that we want companies to look for. And I think a lot of the issues that we're finding with algorithms can be mitigated, resolved somewhat through testing and auditing. Um, and so, you know, you know a, a lot of this may not be intentional, um, but making sure that you are kind of you know, testing, you know, do you have the right data sets? Um, you know, is there a correlation? You know, are you, are you, are you kind of, uh, maybe there's a correlation in the data set, but doesn't necessarily mean there's a causation in the data set. Um, so things like that, that and the, that, that's advice we've provided to companies. We did a, um, an educational blog post for businesses last year where we have a lot of this advice in that. So I'd encourage people to take a look at that. Absolutely. I think that was maybe April of May of last year where you commented on, on some of these um, pieces in terms of understanding the laws that are applying and to your point, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and Section 5 regarding deceptive trade practices, you know, they apply to, to normal activity the same way that they would apply in connection with AI and, and you reinforcing that is, is extremely helpful, but also kind of the, the, the concept of, I do, in my humble opinion, I know in dealing with a lot of clients, a lot of times it's not intentional but you still, that's not enough. Like you need to basically do the testing and the auditing to make sure that the unintended consequences aren't having some sort of impact um, on certain populations so that you don't run afoul of those as well as what I'm hearing from you. And, and it's helpful to, to have that reiterated um, on this on, as a part of this discussion is what you said before with the big data um, uh, project as well as I believe last year. So super helpful um, with respect to with respect to that. And is there, when we talk about like the auditing and the testing that needs to be done, is, is there kind of a, a standard that the FTC looks for in connection with that? Or is it kind of, you know, the company being kind of responsible in figuring out what that looks like for the organization? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we have any particular guidance on that subject, but I would say to companies a couple of things, you know, first of all, I think assessments should be risk based. So maybe if you're kind of figuring out like a toothpaste brand or something like that, you, you might have a less robust risk assessment than if you're analyzing, you know, where to put healthcare resources. Um, and so I think a risk based framework is really important. And so I think for things where consumers lives could be impacted, it could be denied benefits, I certainly think that, you know, uh, outside audits, independent testing, you know, should be considered. I think the idea of making, um, uh, you know, I know there's some intellectual property concerns, but making part of the algorithm or per, some of the inputs public, um, providing some transparency mm -hmm. to what goes into the algorithm. Um, I think that um, that could be beneficial in certain circumstances. Um, so, so again, um, you know, I, I think it's scalable. Um, so depending on what, you know, the, you know, the scope of the algorithm and the uses of the algorithm, and also I think that um, considering more transparency. Great. And, and, and I know you mentioned um, facial recognition. I want to, I know Bill Farley is probably chomping at the bit to, to jump in. I don't want to dominate the, the questions, but Bill, did you want to follow up on some of the facial recognition points yeah. that, um, that many mentioned? Yeah, but thank you. Absolutely. And Manisha, you, you touched on this a little bit um, in your previous answer, but the facial recognition is obviously directly related to the AI issue, right? Uh, and we've seen this. It's been a hot button issue for a few years now. There's countless news reports on the, the uses, the, the dangers of it. Um, and I, we saw in the privacy agenda that the FTC kind of wanted to rethink the harms of facial recognition in then the way it relates to bias and discrimination. So I'm just curious, you know, what are the harms that you guys are seeing? How are you thinking about that now? And what are those priorities going forward in that area? Sure. Okay. So, so in terms of the harms, so the, the Ever Album case that I mentioned, I think the harm there was basically deception, right? They told consumers that they wouldn't use their data for a specific purpose, um, and it was used for that purpose. 
Uh, so I think that's a harm to consumers. Um, I think the harm of basically, I mean, this it almost goes back to the Warren and Brandeis piece about uh, the right to privacy and um, you know your own uh, person. And, 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 and many states have laws about like appropriating somebody else's likeness. And I think there's some analogies there. Um, I think many people would be really nervous about you know if if anybody would be able to whip out their phone and take a picture of them and then I just identify who they are and their profile and their dossier as they were walking down the street. So I think that you know the second harm is just a pure privacy harm, which is um, you know uh, violating the solitude of the person. So I think that's a harm that can come from misuse of facial recognition technology. Um, and then the third is you know discrimination. Um, so. Um, certainly, we've seen you know news reports about algorithms not being able to pick up um, you know certain types of faces, um, certain races, um, and could that be used to you know not let them you know we've seen stories about facial recognition being used to unlock services, whether it's bank accounts or you know your your front door, um, and if they can't recognize certain um, races, then um, that's going to um, be really problematic for those people who are denied those benefits. So. Um, so I think those are some real harms and challenges that come from the use of facial recognition technology. One of the things you had mentioned, um, uh, and I guess one of the novel pieces of relief in our Ever Album case, and this relates to the whole discussion of algorithms, is that traditionally in consumer protection law, we have sought to bring cases where we stop the conduct and, and, and return money to consumers. So let's say the consumer bought um, you know, a product that doesn't work, and consumer protection law has been aimed at getting the money back for the consumer who didn't get the product that they earned. Well, for many of the free products that are powered through you know, artificial intelligence or data, uh, consumers aren't paying. So in our Elver album case, consumers didn't pay for the product, it was free. They were paying with their data. And so we analogize this idea of returning money to consumers and kind of making sure that the company is not profiting um, from ill-gotten gains. So they, you know, they got the money illegally, they need to return the money. In this case, they got the data illegally, they can't return your face or your picture to you. But what they can do is we can disgorge the algorithm. We can say, not only must you delete the pictures, but you must delete any intellectual property that you gathered from those pictures and start from square one on your algorithm. So that was an innovative remedy that we had in the Ever Album case that I could see us using more of. So in these free products that are powered by data, you can't return the data, you can't unring the bell, but you can at least deprive the company of the profits associated with the data. Wow. Well, yeah, that, that's great. Thank you for that. And that, that leads into another one of our questions actually perfectly about the disgorgement of profits. So, you know, presumably it might be hard to put a hard number on, you know, precise economic number on that data. Have there been thoughts on how do you determine what's the right monetary penalty for something like that? That's a great question. Um, and I think one really interesting debate um, on that happened through a case we brought last year um, against an app called Hyperbeard. Um, for those of you who have young kids, these are like the Talking Tom apps and you just kind of you know keep pressing the app and you get a pellet, and, you know, something like that. Um, so uh, we brought a case against the company and we got suspended judgment of $5 million. The company couldn't pay the $5 million, but we assessed the penalty at $5 million. And at the time, Chairman Simons issued a statement justifying the $5 million penalty. Um, we had a dissent from another uh, commissioner, Commissioner Phillips, who said, basically all that happened with this app is that it was powered through behavioral advertising. And so they would, you know, in order to get the app for free, the company um, engaged in behavioral advertising, and that's not that harmful to those consumers. And so we should measure civil penalty based on harm since there was not that much harm, $5 million was too much money. So the majority, uh, or I should say the chairman in that case said, I disagree with Commissioner Phillips. I understand where he's coming from on harm, but in this case, we're looking to disincentivize the conduct. And the, co the company made millions of dollars on those behavioral ads that were illegal and um, or required COPPA compliance that they didn't comply with COPPA. So they made these millions of dollars. And unless you have at least the revenues the company made, the civil penalty doesn't provide the appropriate deterrence. And so his view was that you look to the amount the company makes and you, you disgorge at least that amount um, plus a multiplier because not every company that violates the law is gonna be caught. So, so those are some alternate views on how to calculate civil penalties. 
certainly it's a very, you know, it's, it's not like somebody paid $5 for a product and they should get the $5 back. It's much more difficult to evaluate, but I do think there's some strategies we can use. We can look at how much money the company made, how much money consumers paid out, if any, what was the value of the algorithm that was created through this illegal practice? So those are the types of things that we examine when we look at penalty factors. Wow, no, that, I appreciate that. And that actually um, touches on a key area we wanted to go into regarding targeted advertising and, and, and understanding how you're looking at the remedy with the deterrent versus the, the harm, which I know a lot of times we can say, in, in many targeted um, advertising instances, it can benefit. Well, it, it can be good for the consumer in terms of, you know, I'm looking through, I don't know what I want for so and so thing. And it's feeding me things that can be helpful for me to either purchase or whatever. So there's some good that can come to it, right? But I think what I'm hearing from you in terms of the concern is it, it's fine to do that, but you need to make sure that there is proper disclosures in terms of what's being done and how you're doing and it's not being done in a discriminatory manner. And, and so the, the concerns that you mentioned before um, regarding just, you know, the big picture concerns for how you're going about utilizing utilizing the, the data that you're, you're getting is important. And so, because um, it, it, the big picture question I was going to have is how can we, you know, reap the benefits of what is target advertising yet you know further promote the importance of consumer privacy and i think you touched on it but i, I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that big picture you know sure there's good that can be come from even balancing that against consumer privacy yeah i, I agree with your um framing of the issue quamina um in that there are certainly people who want to see you know ads for shoes that they might want um as opposed to ads that might be irrelevant to them so I think there's guardrails. I think we need to have guardrails around the practice in I think probably three primary areas. Um, the first is, as you mentioned, disclosures, making sure that you're being truthful about um, you know, how you can opt out of targeted advertising and, and you know, what kinds of ads you're gonna get. So a couple of years ago, we brought a case against a company that said, um, hey, we do targeted advertising, but you can opt out through your browser settings or your phone um, settings. Well, in truth, if a customer went to the browser settings or the phone settings, um, these were super cookies that were persistent cookies that could not be um, deleted through the browser settings. And so we alleged that, that was a deceptive practice. So I think the first is be truthful in your disclosures. The second, and this touches on the hyperbeard talking Tom case that I was just talking about. I think that the, the presumption should be flipped when it comes to sensitive data. So what we've said is for non-sensitive data, you know, there can be an opt out option but for sensitive data, it really needs to be opt-in. So if you're tracking children, we think it should be opt-in. If you're tracking people's health information, so it's one thing for me to get an ad for shoes, but it's another thing for me to get an ad for you know, a diabetes product when I search for diabetes. I think most consumers or many consumers may feel comfortable with the shoes or the ad for like the outdoors product or something like that. But if it's a sensitive topic, um, I think that there would be some more concern. So, you know, children, health, financial, sexual orientation, um, I think sensitive areas, the, the presumption should be that there should be opt-in uh, consent. Um, and then the final area I think is, um, I think as we've talked about before, making sure that you're doing testing to make sure that certain populations, certain protected classes aren't seeing, you know, some ads, um, you know, whereas other, other populations are not seeing those same ads. So, so I think those are some general rules of the road. And I think, of course, just whether it's targeted advertising or any other field, I think companies want to look at making sure that they're delete, you know, practicing good data hygiene, deleting the data after they don't have a business need for it, you know, not collecting it if they don't have a business need for it, providing consumers with access and deletion rights, um, things like that. So, um, so I think those are some guardrails, but, but I agree with your statement that, you know, we don't, we don't want to kill the goose I, that's not the right kill, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, and, and I appreciate that. And I love the concept of guardrails, right? And, and what I'm hearing from you also is assessing it based on the risk and the potential harm. There's certain areas where you need to have more, um, you know, scrutiny and, and more um, kind of understanding of the potential risk that can be there and, and govern your 
your approach accordingly is what I heard, which I think is really helpful. Um, I did see, so we do have one question um, in our uh, Q&A that I just want to read. We're about halfway through. And it says, um, what are your thoughts on there being a minimum standard for reasonable security? As more states adopt legislation, do you think there will be an acceptance, acceptance national, nationally for such a standard? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, and um, so I think it, it's an interesting question. It was framed in an interesting way because the question was, what is the minimum standard for data for reasonable security? And I would argue that the standard is reasonable security. I think what the question <laughs> is getting at is, I think there's two schools of thought. Um, one school of thought is, you know, uh, for, you know, the regulation should say, thou shall have reasonable security and not prescribe further what that means. And the idea there is that you know you want companies to have flexibility. You want them to adopt risk-based models. One size doesn't necessarily fit all. I think that's the reasoning behind having this reasonable security standard. I think on the other side of the debate, you have people who say, no, I want more guidance. What does reasonable security mean? What, what bit encryption should I use? You know, when should I have multi-factor authentication? Um, and I think with all things, I think the answer is somewhat in the middle. Um, where um, I think one of the things that we said is that, you know, we're, we as the government don't believe it's appropriate for us to prescribe, you have to have this bit encryption and you have to have this specific access control in place and you have this specific, you know, authentication method. Um, but I do think that what we have said is that there needs to be a process-based approach. Um, so in other words, we're not gonna pre prescribe the technical standards, but we're gonna say, you need to have somebody in charge of security. You need to conduct a risk assessment. You need to oversee service providers. You need to have training. Um, it's not a one and done. You need to have a written program that's updated every year as threats and business models evolve. Um, and so I think that is the type of federal data security legislation that the FCC would like to see. Um, so I think going to the second part of the question in terms of a federal standard. So right now, most states, almost all states, I believe, have data breach notification laws, but I think only seven or eight have reasonable security laws. And so we have always proposed that there be a federal standard um, for uh, data security. And that's something we continue to support um, along with federal privacy legislation. Um, but, um, but we'll see if and when that happens. In the meantime, I think we're doing everything we can under the existing authority that we're given to go after unreasonable security practices. So Benicia, is, is, your, is your answer for that, would that be the same on the privacy side as well? So I know you know people are asking us what what will the standard be? What can we do? Um, give us some guidance here. So I'm just curious if you if you have a different thought on privacy versus security, or if it's kind of the same framework. Yeah, I do have a little bit of a different thought on privacy and security. I think on security because every because it's so technical, you know what 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 network should be segmented. I, I do think I think security is one piece of privacy. So if I were going to think about a privacy. Um, Bill, again, and I'm speaking for myself, not for the Federal Trade Commission. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, uh, if you look at the California law, if you look at the European regulation, it's you know, and I think there's a consensus even among the federal privacy bills, um, things like access and deletion for consumers, um, access to their own data and the ability to delete it, things like um, accountability mechanisms for companies, um, things like privacy notices. Um, so I think there's some consensus generally, if you look at the core bills in Congress, even the Republicans and the Democrats bills, a lot of the core provisions there's consensus around. Um, and I think what's, what's, um, what's creating obstacles for the passage of federal privacy legislation is not the substantive rules of the road, it's the question of whether the federal law should preempt the state law and whether there should be a private right of action. And I think that's where the, the kind of debate is, lies right now. But in terms of substantive privacy, I think, um, I think there's some consensus around specific standards. Great, that, that, that's very helpful. And I, I hadn't thought about it like that, of, of thinking where the, the commonplace, you know, on both sides of the, of the uh, you know, Republican and Democrat, what are the common aspects that are, that they both agree on and not worrying about what the fight is between them um, on the private right of action. So that's, that's very helpful. Yeah. and. Misha, I want to pivot a little bit um, because I know this is something that uh, we've been hearing a lot of from clients, and that's regarding the in the kind of autonomous vehicle space. 
Um, and, you know, we've been speaking a lot of, you know, industry leaders there and about the upcoming push and development to kind of to integrate autonomous vehicles. There's a lot of information that's, that's being collected and used in various aspects in connection with that from safety and, um, and just kind of learning, which isn't going to be important, but also sometimes, you know, information potentially being used in the insurance context um, or, you know, it, it potentially in the decisioning context, depending on what it is. Um, has the FTC given any thoughts to that, given that the, the rise in, in of so much information that's being collected and how, what's a good approach? Um, or, or just what, what, what thoughts are around, are around that? Sure, so, um, you know, we held a workshop on this issue you know, say three or four years ago now, uh, with the um, with NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, um, and um, I think that you know, I think we have seen issues on you know all three all three parts of what you mentioned: the privacy side, what are they collecting about me, um, you know, um, what are they using it for, the um, security side, you know, um, are they you know with with all these you know connected features. Um, can somebody, you know, hack into my car and drive me off the road? Um, and then the third is the kind of eligibility issues, you know, are, is the data, you know, is, is, is the safety data that's being collected um, going to be used by, by insurance companies? I think we had really interesting debates at this workshop, this workshop, because I think in the traditional privacy context, we would say, if you don't want data to be, to be collected, um, make sure consumers have the right to opt out of data collection. Now, when you're talking about connected cars, if too many people opt out, that could undermine the safety features that you're trying to develop when you're talking about like you know, sharing data among cars that are at a four-way stop sign. Um, and so I, I think this, these are issues that you know, everybody's grappling with. I don't have the answer, um, but I do think that these same principles, making sure that companies are not just launching their connected products or you know, without doing testing, um, uh, you know, I think there needs to be kind of pre-release testing, um, particularly where there's safety issues involved um, on the connected on the on the safety side. Um, I think again, if you're using the data for insurance purposes, I think the Fair Credit Reporting Act might apply. Um, and on the privacy side, um, I think one concept that that tends to be useful, and this may be a great example of that, is kind of do, do your privacy practices align with consumers' expectations. So, um, and I, I think this this is where there's been some school of thought that we should be moving away from a notice and choice model where you're, you know, vomiting information to consumers and having putting the burden on them to make choices and moving from that to a use-based model where there's rules of the road that say, okay, you can use this data for safety purposes, but if you're going to use it for marketing or insurance, um, you have to either get opt-in consent or maybe just don't use it for that purpose. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, ways that, you know, federal privacy legislation could um, address that issue. But I think uh, and one of the things, and just to kind of tie the last two questions together, um, you know, every time an issue comes up, whether it's, you know, Internet of Things or targeted advertising or AI, there's always a push for legislation to address that specific issue. We even saw last year during COVID, there were some COVID-specific privacy bills that were introduced. And I guess my personal view is that it would be great to have general federal privacy legislation that's technology neutral that would apply to whatever the issue of the day is. Um, and so in a way, you know, it's what the FTC Act is. This is a statute that was passed in the 1930s um, that prohibits unfair deceptive practices that we never knew there was a thing such as internet privacy in those days. And we've used that language because it's, you know, we've been able to use it as technology neutral, it's flexible, it's withstood the test of time. Um, and we've used that to go after different practices that we see in the marketplace. So I think that my personal view is rather than enact specific legislation on specific topics, you know, general privacy legislation that could apply to anything that comes up would be useful. No, and, and I think that's helpful, understanding that's your, your personal view, because it's, I, I know when speaking with a lot of clients in terms of, you know, looking at this, understanding what laws are actually applying and what's on the horizon and knowing there's a lot of bills out there and what, what could get passed, what may not be. And I, I think for a lot of um, companies, understanding the landscape and, and them wanting to make sure that they're complying is very important. But as it's evolving, it becomes more difficult. And so like trying to do that balance is, is very is very important. So you're, yeah. with it, it, your it, approach. I was gonna yeah, say, go if I could just make one caveat to what I said, 
Um, I think that's probably yeah. what I've said is in my experience is at the federal level, where I find federal that you level. get like maybe one bite at the apple um, or maybe two bites at the apple. And I think the states are different. Um, and so we, you talked at the opening about BIPA um, that applies specifically to biometric information. And I think the states, you know, can be laboratories in specific areas and can help us determine what works and what doesn't work. So I don't know that my comments apply exactly. Got it. And, and that's helpful. And, and I know Bill may have more to, to talk about with the, with the BIPA piece, but I, I think one thing that even knowing, um, you know, and specifically as we talk about kind of technology and, and even I'm, I'm going to touch a little bit on the, the, the AI piece and how um, existing laws do apply, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you have you know, for instance, in, in the AI context, you have someone who's developing the AI, maybe they're selling it to a third party and there are certain conditions on how it was supposed to be used. Maybe it wasn't used in that particular way. And then, you know, maybe there was human intervention before it actually happened. So there's there's the question of who is the, the actor and how does that implicate um, culpability when it comes to some of these laws, right? And And so those types of questions of, how can once once you have these mechanisms out there, how do you control them to, to, to reduce consumer harm, but knowing that there's multiple elements that can impact that, given yeah. that it's technology and not just an individual person behind it. And so I, I love the fact and, and appreciate the the background and the framework in which we work, which is section five, you know, ECOA, FCRA, which we all know and, and work with every day and love, but applying that, you know, sometimes in the context when there's evolving technology involved and who are the actors and things are moving at like lightning speed pace just makes for a fascinating, um, mm -hmm. it, it makes it fascinating on our part in terms of helping to kind of right. advise on, on how you can apply in it and hearing from you um, in, in that context about, yep, it still applies, just makes us think even harder for how we help the clients. So, yeah. And so I, I think I, framed um, I think you framed the issue really well. And I think, you know, one of the issues that you just touched on um, was, you know, the oversight of service providers. And I think like everything else, the, 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 you know, the, the issues, they're not necessarily unique to the technology space. So a lot of times you'll have a company outsource development of an AI to another company. Um, they're still your service provider and you're still responsible for what they do. And so what we tell companies is that if you're outsourcing particular functions to service providers, we have kind of three rules of the road. The first is make sure you're doing the due diligence to make sure that the person you hire is capable of implementing your instruction. Um, the second is to have contractual provisions in place, you know, um, requiring these guardrails as we've talked about earlier. Um, and the third is, is potentially auditing those requirements so that if any red flags come up um, in the relationship with the service provider, the contractor, the tech provider, whoever it is, um, that you have mechanisms in place to ask questions and follow up. Um, so I think that's a you, you highlighted a really important point. Now, in, in those three points that you mentioned, I want to underscore that you know diligence on the front end, contractual guardrails, and then you know auditing on the back end. Because I know sometimes um, the, the auditing aspect is where there there could be some pushback. And you know, is certification enough? Meaning, you know, I'm certifying that I'm doing all these things. Trust me, right? Is is that enough in certain instances, or is there is there you know no Trusting is fine, but trust to verify you need those auditing rights. This is a lot of times yes. that, you know, the questions come back. And is, and is that kind of a, a risk um, that, that you can weigh in connection with pushing back on that? Or is that kind of in terms of auditing rights versus um, certifying, you know, that you're doing that? Um, right. I, or, or I, I think it's going to be very auditing fact. Rights possible? Yeah, I think it's going to be very fact dependent. I think we talked earlier about the sensitivity of the product or the, you know, I think going to depend on that. I think it's going to depend on the relative bargaining power. Like power, if you're a small company that's hired Microsoft to be your tech provider, you might not be able to have as many rights as, you know, so, um, but I do think that, you know, certainly, you know, keeping abreast of issues, you know, you know, putting in a Google alert, you know, for any red flags in the particular area that you're looking at. Um, I think that type of, um, that type of, and, and, you know, auditing might be a word that has certain connotations. But certain yeah. double checking. We double right. checking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aud auditing has a very powerful word in different meanings in different contexts. So I know people get scared away from that. But to to your pieces, um, the, the double checking are you know is 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 important. So I appreciate that. Um, 
And Bill, I know you, you may have a question. I know Manisha, you mentioned kind of on the front end, kind of health and health apps um, in connection with one of the priority pieces, which I know is very important. I think Bill, you may have had a follow-up question in connection with that. Yeah, uh, for sure. And the, the question is kind of, we, we've seen in the privacy agenda an expansion or the mention of an expansion of the breach notification rule for health data that's not HIPAA covered, right? So I was curious about kind of the mechanics of how that would work or what the considerations are for that expansion. Yeah, okay. So so maybe just let me provide some context um, for that for that question. So um, back in, I want to say 2009, 2010, Congress passed the High Tech Act, which updated HIPAA in certain ways. And one of the things the High Tech added was a health breach notification requirement for HIPAA. And they provided an analogous health re breach requirement for non-HIPAA covered entities that were offering um, personal health records. And that's a very defined term. And it's a very kind of, it's almost like a labyrinth of definitions that you have to follow from HHS and, and SSA. So it's kind of complicated. Um, but I think the background, so additional background for your question is that what's interesting is that as more and more data, as more and more consumers are using health apps, um, that goes beyond HIPAA. So, you know, you have your HIPAA box and then you have everything that's outside your HIPAA box. And the HIPAA box is essentially, and I'm not a HIPAA lawyer, but as I understand it, it's information you provide to your doctor's office, your hospital, your insurance company. Um, but once you provide it to an app, that's like, you know, a, a tech app or a commercial app, you might be the exact same data about your conditions and your diagnoses and your medications, but it's not covered by HIPAA, but it is covered by the FTC Act. And it may be covered by the health breach notification rule in case you experience a breach. And so we first enacted that rule, I wanna say 2010 or so. And it's our policy that every time we enact a rule, every 10 years, we review the rule to make sure that it's keeping up with changes in technology and business models. And so last year we announced that we were reviewing the health breach notification rule because it had been 10 years and we wanted to hear about um, uh, any changes in, in technology and business models. We got a number of comments um, on that rule that's public. Um, and I think we're considering next steps at this point, but, but as you, you know, as I said in my opening, it continues to be a, a strong priority for the FTC. Um, and especially as more and more health data is flowing outside the HIPAA controlled system. Um, and I think deserves pretty much the same level of protection. It's the same data. Yeah, no, I, go ahead, Bill. Oh, and I, I was actually, I was going to have an, another a follow up to something you mentioned earlier, Manisha. Um, and I think, Kwamita, you mentioned it with the, the BIPA discussion, and it also came up in the autonomous vehicles discussion. One of the interesting things you said, Manisha, was for people to focus on aligning with what the consumer's expectation is. And I'm, I'm curious from the commission standpoint, how do you evaluate that? You know, what, what are you looking at? When you're doing that analysis, because I think on our side sometimes that you can get a little bit distorted. So it'd be interesting to hear how you guys think about it. Sure. So I, I think the um, I think probably the number one source of information about consumer expectations is is when you do specific copy testing. So um, so when we go to litigation and we allege unfair deceptive practices, particularly where we allege deceptive practices, we will often show consumers the language and we will learn things about preconceptions consumers bring to that language. Um, and so I think asking consumers is the number one way to get at consumer expectation information. Um, I think another way to get at that, so, so in other words, if, you're, if I'm a company trying to determine what consumers' expectations are, um, you know, maybe I do a survey of my own consumers or maybe I kind of, you know, I, I should have my finger on the pulse of what my customers want. Um, I think that you know, when we look at uh, consumer expectations, we also look at survey data. Um, Pew Research, for example, has put out a lot of data about um, consumers' expectations and attitudes towards privacy. Um, lots of academic institutions have done studies on kind of what consumer, how consumers value privacy and what they would pay for privacy. Um, and so I think we have, um, you know, information around those efforts. But I think your question gets at just, it is a little bit elusive, you know, what consumers want. Um, and it can be a little bit elusive. And we might not know um, until we ask consumers what they want. But I think we could make certain um, you know, judgments um, based on survey data, based on expert, our expertise, um, you know, based, on, um, you know, based on public outcry. You know, sometimes um, you'll see a company unveil something 
and there'll be public outcry, whether in the press or you know, from consumers directly or customers directly, and the companies will scrap those plans um, to implement those changes. So, um, so I do think there's a number of sources, but I take your point that you know, it's not as easy as it sounds to you know, divine what consumers' expectations are. And to that point of, of you know, what consumers want, I, I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, consumers having more control over their data um, and what that would potentially look like and how that can potentially help in certain areas regarding you know, information that's being collected, um, they're really being informed consent regarding the opt-in and opt-out and people understanding what that is. Um, and in particular, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about kind of the, the monetization of the consumer data and the consumer potentially having knowledge about what that looks like, right? Because um, we, we, we do feel in some instances there's, it's possible that there is, um, there, there's a value that's placed on, you know, all the different clicks that you have that's used in the background. But us, as consumers on the, uh, who are doing it every day, we may not have an awareness around, around that. Has there been any um, thought discussion on any level about, you know, that being something that consumers would want to know or, or should know yeah. um, regarding, regarding um, how their data is being used and monetized? Yeah. No, that, that's a great question. And it's, you know, I've talked a lot about kind of the enforcement actions that we've brought and where we've alleged violations of Section 5 or one of the other laws we enforce. The other tool we have that we've used quite a bit lately is the, um, the industry study tool. So we have a tool that's called 6B of the FTC Act, which basically allows us to um, send questions to industry members and develop reports about their practices. So there are two studies that we have ongoing right now. One is of broadband privacy, where we've asked broadband providers um, how they're collecting and using consumer data. And the reasoning behind that is, you know, A, um, during COVID, more consumers than ever are subscribing to broadband. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a black box, you know, what these companies are doing with your data other than providing the service, survey, uh, other than providing the service. So we're trying to shine a light on those practices and, and kind of create more transparency surrounding what they're using your data for and how they're monetizing it. Similarly, we have a study of, that we've announced of social media and video streaming services. Um, and in that study, we are asking questions that run the gamut of what we've been talking about. We ask them about how they develop their algorithms and how they collect information and what they use it for. And we ask about competition issues and how they monetize the issue, how they monetize the information. We ask about how they deal with children's data. So I think it's just a way right now, as you say, consumers really don't have any idea how their data is being valued. And this is these reports and studies are a way to um, to illuminate that, you know, not necessarily, I don't know that consumers are sitting down and reading these reports, but, you know, for policymakers, for the press who then kind of, um, you know, we do try to do consumer education around these issues as well. No, absolutely. And, and that's, um, I'm, I'm glad that you reinforced that because I know that there was a, a lot of inquiries that went out. I think it was earlier in this year surrounding those questions and, and that you're in the process of kind of compiling, getting those answers um, will, will be good. And I guess once you have that, there'll be an educational aspect in there and then where that goes, we'll see. Okay, wonderful. Um, I know we, we, only, we have a, just a few, minutes, a few minutes left and we touched on a lot of different issues that are here. If folks have um, questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A piece because um, we, we probably have, have another five minutes left, but I wanted to um, raise an issue you mentioned at the very top of the hour regarding ed tech and, and the importance of that in connection with kind of the FTC and the priorities. Can, can you talk a little bit about, about that a little bit more and in terms of what the focus is and the concern? Definitely understand when COVID, more, people, more children being online and learning online um, being an impetus, but what's being done around that? Sure. So, um, so we enforce the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which requires parental consent before collecting information from children under 13. And in the school's context, we provided guidance saying, 
the school can be an agent of the parent for purposes of providing consent, as long as the information is used only for an educational purpose and not a commercial purpose. So you can use the, um, you know, the kid's information to do the homework app, but you can't do behavioral advertising on the homework app because that would be a commercial purpose. Um, and so, so we're you know, uh, looking at a number of companies to make sure that they're not using the information for commercial purpose. Um, I think the other area that is of interest that has been of interest to us is, um, and I think this both touches on COVID as well as the racial justice piece, um, is these um, exam proctoring apps. Um, so exam proctoring apps use, um, so you know, now that people aren't taking exams in person or haven't been taking exams in person, these apps offer themselves as a way to make sure that people aren't cheating. So they do gaze tracking and they do kind of, you know, algorithms to see if a person might have like a, an app open on the side or something like that. Um, and there've been reports that, you know, um, that these algorithms have, you know, been racially discriminatory um, and so these are kind of the, the kinds of issues that we want to look at um, and um, and um, and just see if there's anything anything there. Right. Now, I, I think that's helpful because I know that it's becoming, especially in the past year, there's been more and more activity around it, surrounding that, and so understanding kind of some of the core issues that companies should need to be aware of in connection with that. Um, is is it is very important. So I appreciate you raising you raising that concern. And I wanted to um, I think as as we look to to wrap this up. And Bill, if you have more questions, let us know. But I wanted to just make sure if there was anything else of interest that we have not touched on. I want to make sure that you think you know we we have an audience of you know close. Um, to 100 plus folks who are online listening to us from various different industries um, wanting to kind of hear from from you and the FTC about the privacy in the wake of this. Um, I know we touched on a number of issues from autonomous vehicles to, um, you know, ed tech to healthcare to targeted advertising, but are there, is there, is there any other um, points you would like to raise or get across to to the group before we would wrap up? Well, so maybe I maybe I can re ask this uh, or answer this question or try to answer this question that came up in the Q and A. Um, and I think this uh, the questioner is essentially asking about um, what we sometimes call the privacy paradox. Um, and the privacy paradox is where you know people say they care about privacy, but when it comes to exchanging, you know, there's been studies like you know um, on a college campus, somebody was saying, if you give me the last four digits of social of your social, I'll give you a pizza. And like almost everybody took them up on that offer. So, so when you when you ask people in the abstract whether they care about privacy, everybody says yes. But when you ask them about specific trade-offs, they might not care as much. So I think that's the argument that the uh, the people who you know talk about the privacy par paradox present. Um, I just push back on that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I I'm sure there's there's something there, but um, you know if you uh, it's one thing to say, hey, I'm doing an experiment, and if you give me this four numbers and I'll give you pizza. Um, but if you're going to then put the four numbers, you know, um, on the um, internet, um, or if you told the person, hey, I'm going to, you know, publicize this or sell it to a bunch of people, I, I don't, I, I don't think that, that, you know, you get as many takers on pizza. Um, so I think the, the context, so I do, there's been some studies on this, but I think the context of these studies matter. So, so I think, you know, the one thing I would say is that there have been certain studies where, you um, People have been asked about trade-offs. I know there's one study where um, people were asked um, if they would, you know, take money it, to publicize the purchase of a sex toy. And in that context, very few people said yes. Whereas if it was a context of a pair of shoes, most people said sure. You know, um, so so I think the context matters. The context of the experiment matters. Um, I think that um, you know there's and there's lots of literature on this topic, lots of literature, um, and um, I think that um, and this is going to continue to be a debate. I, I think there's some truth to the fact that in an abstract survey, consumers might overemphasize you know how much they care about privacy, um, but you know a lot of people use loyalty cards. But I guess what I would argue is that you know. It, the the disclosures matter, the context matters, um, and as long as you're kind of using the information consistently with consumers' expectations, that's going to be less problematic than if you're going to 
post them on the internet or sell them to a bunch of third parties or uh, and it's also going to depend on the sen sensitivity of the information so a lot to unpack there but um, that was a quick answer to the privacy paradox Great, yeah, and, and thank you for, for raising, for, for answering that question was raised in the Q&A, because I know the, the whole concept of, we're potentially more concerned than what the consumer is about their privacy is a piece, but I do, I, I do think there's a lot of different views out there, and so quite frankly, understanding the broad range of views is important, and, and maybe education is the key in terms of people having the freedom and ability to weigh that. Maybe they do, you know, do want to give away you know, all their information for a hamburger, but they at least need to know what information they're giving away, right? Um, and so, um, so that, that's helpful. And, um, and, and with that, I mean, we literally have two minutes um, left. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Manisha. Uh, you have been wonderful. There's it's been an hour jam packed of lots of great information that you've provided. And, and through this, there were a lot of themes that came through in terms of, you know, measuring, you know, being transparent and so that you're not running afoul of kind of Section 5 of the FTC Act and, and, and not being deceptive when engaging consumers, you know, making sure that you're measuring the, the risk with the potential consumer harm in terms of how you approach different aspects of, um, you know, complying, understanding what laws may apply, whether it's the FCRA, whether it's the ACOA, whether it's Section 5 and how that overlays with the activity that you're doing. And then what I what I thought was extremely um, important was was the concept of responsibility on our end in terms of you know really utilizing technology um, and understanding how it's being used in the you know in the testing on the front end as well as on the back end to understand if it's having a desperate impact is it impacting consumers in a certain way and being responsible for that so so many amazing tidbits that you have shared with us uh, we truly truly appreciate your your time uh, spending with us this after this afternoon and I want to thank my um, my colleague Bill Farley for for sitting down and having this discussion with us and with you today and I want to thank everyone for joining us um, for this episode of conversations that matter with the FTC um, and hearing directly from the FTC um, we're greatly appreciative um, and we hope everyone has a great day thank you thank you, thank you so much Manisha.